findings jive with what you've known for years about what these groups are doing and how they're connecting these two issues of LGBT rights and, and SRH. Great. Um, people can hear me, right? Okay, um, great. Well, I think the, the, the ordering of the panel is very good following on Kat and Brittany because both were talking about the intersectionality of the issues. Um, and uh, Kat had mentioned that we're very siloed, or at least in Arizona, there was sort of LGBT groups doing their work, SRH doing theirs. So for um, our opposition, they don't make that distinction. Uh, they put us already in that bucket together, and so uh, they've actually been able to be very productive in their work by doing so, so it's really encouraging to hear that we're also making those connections more naturally, even though it might, there might be some discomfort or maybe um, you know, not an initial sort of uh, awareness that there is uh, connectivity between the two issues. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Alliance Defending Freedom. This is an article. Just a quick show of hands. Has anybody here actually heard of Alliance Defending Freedom? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are you guys from Arizona? Yeah. Because so what's interesting Nevada. is, again, you know, having sort of the state experience mapped out for us to really think about this Arizona-based organization and what they're doing internationally. And so they're active everywhere, um, and I decided for this article to really focus in on their work in Latin America, um, because they recently announced that this is part of their new shift, um, and it's one that certainly we as activists need to be aware of and learn from. And so um, in terms of major findings, um, I, again, you're obviously a, a well-informed crowd, so I, I won't go into too much depth. but. Really what uh, Alliance Defending Freedom does is litigate, and they are a legal organization and they're extremely well endowed. They have an annual budget of about $40 million, um, and, but that doesn't include their, they have a big sort of army of lawyers, and they're pro bono lawyers. And so, you know, that, that's a whole other uh, pocket of money that they also have because they have all these lawyers doing their work for them. And so um, we've recently seen, and again, they've announced that they're going to be moving into Latin America. And um, when I'm thinking about why are they doing this, you know, really it's, it's a testament to the work that we are, are doing because it's reactive uh, in, in large part. So one of the places that we see them inserting themselves, at least in a very visible space, is um, at the Organization of American States. So this is the regional body that oversees um, all of the I think 16 countries in Latin America. And so uh, within the OAS, there's also different um, uh, legal bodies, which include the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. And so these two bodies are places where uh, progressives like us have advanced uh, our cause. And so um, in both these, the court and the commission, it's been generally supportive and open to our issues. And so we see now, as a result, that they, they ADF and their allies have really increased their work um, in these fora. And so um, they became quite visible in 2013 at the, uh, the OAS has a general assembly, the annual meeting. And um, this one in Guatemala, they, there was a debate on what we would think would probably be fairly uncontroversial. There's two conventions, one on racism and one on discrimination. Um, and what happens at these places is that the countries debate the language and then they ratify it. Um, and they're non-binding to the extent that no one's going to prosecute them if you don't fulfill what's in there, but it is significant in that it has you know, legal authority, and so one can reference them. So what ADF did was they allied themselves, and ADF is an evangelical group. They uh, allied themselves with the Catholic Church and Catholic groups, and there was two sort of layers of their activism. One was at the sort of grassroots level where they were protesting outside um, the, the the place where the, uh, the event was taking place, and then also they were lobbying delegates. And this is the, the place where they're most effective, and, and for our work, the most dangerous. And what they did was they basically went around and saying that because these uh, conventions included protection for LGBTQ people, that that was effectively discriminating against, against their religious freedoms and their religious rights. So um, coming back to this intersectionality, what the opposition has done so successfully is to use this religious freedom framework um, to protect themselves and to attack us. And so, um, you know, you were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, this question of religiosity. And so it's something that we need to, um, you know, consider how we approach because they've done it as, um, you know, it, it's the, the shield sword 
you know, it's supposed to be used as a shield and they're using it as a sword. They're really using it to come after us. Um, and so um, the, the main findings, um, well, so anyway, so, so, sorry, so to go back to this, this uh, General Assembly, so what happened is that a bunch of countries did not ratify these conventions. And, um, and there was a big sort of protest in the halls of the OAS, which really broke with diplomatic protocol. You kind of don't do that there, you know. So they're bringing a very aggressive vibe to their work, um, and, and they're very much presenting themselves as victims. Um, and so that's another thing we need to consider is, um, you know, they're very sense and they're you know, putting out this message that we're victimizing them. Uh, where in, in fact what's really happening when you look at this convention against discrimination and racism is that they're taking away our rights. So that's, that's what's in balance and that's the, the conversation and that's one that they're leading which makes us again defensive. So um, all these are sort of lessons learned that we can, you know, maybe in the discussion period really engage in what does that mean and how do we respond. Um, and uh, I mean, just to, just to sort of wrap up about the Alliance Defending Freedom, and it's, you know, it's a long article and it's hard to condense in five minutes, but my big thought is really that, you know, we should see how they work at the different layers, right? So they, you got them right here in Arizona State. Uh, obviously they're working, you know, they filed amicus briefs um, in the uh, marriage equality uh, case before the Supreme Court. They're working at the OAS, so that's at the regional level. Um, and they also work at the national level in other countries. And so there's several cases that were before it, <coughs> excuse me, the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, where they also filed amicus briefs, but they were also active at um, national legislatures. So you really see them inserting themselves. And it should be of concern to us. And again, just looping it all back, making it to linkages that it does start here in Arizona. Um, and so how do we attend to that in our work? <laughs>